welcome to Economics Applied. I'm Stephen Davis at the Hoover Institution. Today I'm here with Nick Bloom to talk about work from home and productivity. Nick is a Stanford economics professor, prolific researcher, noted authority on management practices, economic uncertainty, and work from home. Uh, the, the topic of today's discussion. His household spans major parts of the Anglosphere. Nick hails from England, as you might notice from his accent. His wife is Scottish, his kids are American, and he lives here on Stanford's campus. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, Steve, very much for having me on. And I should say we are long-term friends and co-authors as well to add into the mix. We are, and I was just going to put our put the cards on the table in that respect. Um, you know, we've worked extensively with Scott Baker on economic policy uncertainty and stock market jumps and with others. And in recent years, since the pandemic struck, uh, we've been studying the rise of work from home and its implications. And I tried to count up the number of collaborators we have in, in the various projects, and it's more than a dozen. And I couldn't figure out exactly how many we had. Um, so also on, on that same front, along with Jose Maria Barrero and others, uh, we conduct the U.S. survey of uh, working arrangements and attitudes, that's monthly, and the global survey of working arrangements with a larger team that's a, uh, roughly at an annual frequency. So audience members can find survey results and sign up for our monthly newsletter at wfhresearch.com if they're interested. So that's the that's the advert. Let me just set the stage um, for the discussion today. And I'll do this briefly, but I'm, I, I think you and I both come from a similar viewpoint on where we are and what's happened and why. And, and it's going to be a premise, I think, for the rest of the discussion. So full days work from home um, as of mid-2023 or somewhere around a quarter of all paid working days uh, among Americans 20 to 64 years old. And that, that screened out people who only earn like 10 or 20,000 a year. Uh, so we're screening out low-wage part-time jobs in that number. That number comes from the survey of working arrangements and attitudes that we run with Jose. It's about four times the rate in 2019. Okay, so that's the that's the big shift to work from home. Um, the pandemic has also triggered an innovation speed up in technologies that support remote collaboration and, and uh, video conferencing and the like, and that reinforces the shift to work, to, to work from home. I, you and I, along with folks at the um, Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, also survey business executives regularly. And in July, we asked them, you know, what do you think is going to happen to work from home at your own company? Not, not in general, the macroeconomy, but your own company. And then we, we tallied up the responses and averaged them. And business executives think on average that work from home rates are actually going to go up a little bit over the next five years. So that's kind of you know, I think uh, some factual background. You and I have written at length about how the big shift to work from home came about, why it will stick. For today's conversation, let's just take it for granted that work from home is here to stay. Uh, there are profound implications for the economy and society. And I, I want to focus today's discussion on the productivity implications. So, Nick, you are one of the world's leading experts on this topic. In fact, you wrote a major study on the topic years before the pandemic titled, Does Working From Home Work? Evidence from a Chinese Experiment. And that paper appeared in the uh, Quarterly Journal of Economics. So tell us, Nick, how this study came about. Nobody, not many people were thinking about work from home before the pandemic. Why you wrote this study and, and what you learned from it. Great. So the study came about, in all honesty, from a piece of good fortune. So James Liang, who was the founding CEO and at that point chairman of C-Trip, happened to be sitting in my class. So this is very Stanford. I had somebody who is worth hundreds of millions of dollars quietly sitting in the back of the class. I'd actually done some work on work from home back in 2005, so I'd long been interested. I'm one of four kids. Both my parents worked full time for the British government. They used to work from home sporadically when there were like childcare disasters in you know the 80s. So I'm 50. So you know, so I was like, I remember in the 80s that I mean it was horrible back then. It was just shuffling pieces of papers before the era of the personal computer. And James said his company was in Shanghai. Real estate was really expensive, and they're trying to figure out how to expand the call center, which is pretty critical. This is a call center operation. 
And they thought, well, look, maybe we have folks work from home. And their fear was people just goof off. You know, there was the joke about the three great enemies of work from home was the bed, the fridge and the television. And someone would fall victim to one or many. And so they set up this experiment under the view of, look, they're obviously going to goof off. How much will they goof off? How much less productive will they be? Let's compare that to the space savings. So what the experiment did is it took 250 people and it randomized them by even an odd birthday. And if you're in Vercom as the winner, the treated people, you got to work from home four days a week. And if you're the uh, even birthdays, you had to come in as normal all five days. Nick, did did every did everyone have to participate in this randomization, or could you say no? I know that I won't be able to resist the fridge, and so I'm I'm just going to opt out. Great question. So only about half of people volunteered. So a typical team's got 15 people. In a typical team, that means maybe seven volunteered and eight didn't. And then within the volunteers, we randomize. So in a typical team, you're looking at three folks work from home. And so we track them. We have amazing data because they're in a call center. So first things have headsets on and the calls drop in. They randomly listen into 1% of calls to give you a quality metric. Um, they're typically working shifts. Let's think Monday to Friday, nine to five. So what did they find? Three findings. One is amazingly, like they were stunned. The performance went up 13%. So they're like expecting a negative number. Turns out, you know, quality was totally the same and they were processing 13% more calls. And I'm like, how on earth did this happen? And it turns out 9% of it was they're just working more minutes. And if you look in the data, turns out if you're working from home, you don't, you're not late for work. So if your shift is nine to five, you really start at nine. In the office, people are coming in 9.20 because the motorbike broke down or whatever. They're taking much shorter lunch breaks, shorter toilet breaks, less breaks, less sick leave. Every, you know, put it all together, they're working 9% more. And then the other 4% is they're just processing calls faster per minute. When you interviewed them, they said, well, as obvious, it's quiet at home. It's like really noisy in the office. There's, you know, there's a cake in the breakout room or somebody crying or there's someone that told me in the cubicle next door to her, someone would clip their toenails under the desk. She said, <laughs> they think I don't know, but I tell you, I know, I totally know. And it's disgusting. You know, so that was, that was finding, I'll pause there, but that was finding one. There's amazement. They were 13% more productive if they work from home. So uh, did I want to go back to the people who opted out. And the, the reason I ask about this is, the experiment that you're describing has already got a form of selection. Yeah. People who know that they're not going to be effective working remotely, either because they can't concentrate or there's, or they don't have enough space to work at home are presumably disproportionately among those who opted out. And that's quite different than the experience in the midst of the pandemic when everybody was compelled in many jobs to work from home. So did you ask these people who opted out why or do you have any insight to share on that no no we didn't but a really interesting thing exactly on point is what happened at the end of the experiment so i'll very briefly give you results two and three then go exactly to the point so result one productivity is up 13 percent. result two quit rates dropped by half they re on average these folks really like it i mean so much that you know the quit rates fall by half which is an enormous difference yep. fact three unfortunately promotion rates also fall by half and so that's the sting in the tail. You're not in the office. You're not seeing what's going on. You're missing out and stuff. Then in terms of opting out or selection effects, at the end of the nine-month experiment, the company looked at it and said, this is great. We're saving on space. People are 13% more uh, productive. They're much less likely to quit. Promotion rate is something we can work on. You know, it's hard, to, but it's not so directly impacting the company's profit. And so it rolled it out. And what you saw is of the people that originally opted not to take part in the experiment, one third of them changed their mind. So these are folks that said, you know what, I, you know, I, maybe I do want to work from home. Interesting enough, 50% of the people that did initially volunteer also changed their mind and came back into the office. And that group we did interview and we asked them, you know, why are you now voluntarily commuting four times, or, you know, five times a week rather than once? 50% of their pay is performance pay. So they're implicitly taking a pay cut. They're then more productive. Right. Why are you doing that? And they basically said it's incredibly lonely at home. It's kind of lonely, depressing, isolating. On your point also, what was stunning, we wrote it up in the papers, if you look at the people that volunteered, so the kind of hardcore that stuck with it, their productivity increase was not 13%, it was like 22%. So it's classic, exactly as you said. Some folks, and look at students, for some students that work in their bedrooms, because they're very focused, can do it. Other people need to go to the library, and others, as we know, don't work at all. So, you know, there's like a spread. And... 
it seemed to be the same thing. People know they have pets or somebody told me about a dog that they had their dog at home and, you know, the dog would sit at, the, at their feet looking up for snacks all day. And they said, I can't deal with it. Two, two follow-up questions, Nick. If I were, you know, this is, these are almost questions for James, but maybe we've talked to him about it. If people are really lonely at home and that's why they don't want to work from home four or five days a week, well, maybe what if they want to work from home just two days a week? And is, was, is that an option? So, and the second follow-up question is on this promotion point. So again, I'm putting myself in the CEO's shoes and I'm learning from this experiment that people, most people are more productive uh, when they work from home, at least the ones who are willing to do so. And yet they might reasonably be concerned about their promotion prospects. So is there some way to um, thread that needle and make it so people can be rewarded for their high productivity when they're working from home without hurting their promotion prospects? Did did the company put in any changes after your study to, to address either of those concerns? Great. So I'll take it in reverse. On, on the second part on promotion, I think there are two things going on. One is uh you know what i call discrimination you're literally not in the office people forget about you they don't treat you and it's, it's not nothing to do with real performance that you can try and train against and there are some ways to deal with that it's not perfect but you can it help to kind of reduce the impact the other factor is how you quite measure productivity so i was actually giving a big exec ed you know dinner speech last night and this came up a lot is we are measuring calls processed you know per minute but there's another side of productivity is learning the company culture, knowing what's going on, setting yourself up for management. What you heard is the folks in the office said, well, look, we are, you know, 13 percent less efficient. But part of that time is spent in over lunch and over coffees chatting to people. And it means we know what's going on. And we're actually better suited to be managers. So from the firm's perspective, the discrimination part you can train against. The training thing you do need some in a kind of it's a short and long run trade off. Right. When I talk to firms now, the big thing really is everyone in the team should be on the same schedule. If all of them, all 15, have been working from home four days a week, we wouldn't have seen this effect. The tricky thing is you have a team of 15, of which three are, say, at home, and the other 12 are in the office. So it's pretty obvious who's going to get the promotion. So that's really this issue with a lot of companies. You've got to have some kind of parity amongst pools of people competing to get promoted, because otherwise you have this you know, nasty leave-out issue. So last question on this study that comes to mind. Did the people who participated in work from home, what happened to their productivity over time when they were working from home? Did it immediately jump? Did it gradually increase? It, it, Did they figure was, out how to work remotely? Or what was it? Yeah, it was pretty flat. Um, I think it went up. You know, I'd have to go back. This is I did, I did this study now 13 years ago, actually. It's most, you know, I did it, it. We're now, you know, late 2013, and I did it back in uh, 2010 to 2012. It was pretty flat over time. Um, I think immediate. I mean, this this matches what the story is that it's about saving time and about quiet. There wasn't so much about. I mean, there were two or three days of drop. So there was, you know, some chaos an issue where people's computers weren't working. Etc. Okay. Then you asked the other question you asked about why not do two days a week with that company was called C Trip. It actually bought another company called Trip, and they effectively merged and it took the Trip name. So it's now called Trip.com. Same company basically. It's one of the global big three travel agents with Expedia and and uh, Booking. And they, in 2021, 22, did another experiment, which is more like what you, you're asked about. So they randomized work from home for two days a week, same even odd birthdays, but this time it's on managers and professionals. So probably much more like people that are listening. So they're all grads. One third were post-grads with CS, MBAs, et cetera, masters. There they found absolutely no effect on productivity. Um, so this is, you know, people writing code, doing marketing campaigns, doing accounts, they looked at promotions, lines of code written, performance reviews, all kinds of stuff, just a flat zero everywhere. They again found a dramatic reduction in quit rates, fell by a third. They didn't mm -hmm. find any effect on promotions. That was a much more positive story in a sense, because when you know the firm looked at it and rolled the whole thing out again, and they said, look, for professionals, for senior folks, having them work from home two days a week is the option to they're only taking up typically one and a half days a week doesn't seem to affect performance we're organized they come in we get our stuff done on the three or four days in the office but they love it and you know you talk to the employees and they'd say look if i want to go to the dentist and now at home on a friday i can do that if i want to go see my parents i can leave at 3 p.m on the friday make up a bit of time on the train or so 
that is why hybrid has become so dominant in the US. There doesn't appear to be much impact on productivity of any, actually, but employees really like it. Right. So so let me let me just make one broad point, which I know you're well aware of, but it's 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 worth making um, for the audience. You've, you've described two experimental studies where, you know, by and large, there were positive effects. And the first one on productivity and, and retention and on the second one, employee happiness and retention, if not productivity. But I think it's a, it's really important to understand that there is no uniform answer to the question of how work from home affects productivity. It's going to vary across people, as we've already discussed, tasks, jobs, workers, managers, and so on. It's also going to depend on the organization's capabilities and whether they're where they've optimized their management practices, their performance evaluation, and so on uh, for work from home. So maybe you can say something about settings where work from home doesn't work very well. Totally. So th there's two different broad things. One is fully remote. So to be clear, fully remote is you're working from home five days a week, week in, week out. The other is what I'm going to call hybrid, where you're typically working from home, let's say Monday and Friday. So the evidence on hybrid, I discussed a bit of it, but generally it's flat. So typically the evidence on hybrid is it's not massively positive or negative. There's a number of studies, they all honestly come out close to zero. It's super popular because employees like it and it reduces retent or quit rates. So let's come back to fully remote. Fully remote, the numbers are like all over the place. So there are figures of minus 30 up to, you could, the one we discussed earlier is, you know, plus 13. So you got almost a, you got a 43% span. So how on earth is this going on? If you look at the big negatives, the, the things that you find drives these big negatives is basically no planning and you know, bad management. So the big negatives tend to be firms that rushed to work from home early on in the pandemic, and we have some kind of treatment and control rough setup. But you can imagine if you suddenly go fully remote in April 2020, there's no equipment, managers aren't trained, you don't have right. performance reviews, there's a lot of people using horrible surveillance screenshot. I mean, it's just, it doesn't really work. If you look at the positives, take the CTO of experiment I mentioned, they had you know remote quality reviews because they're listening in. There's a lot of performance data. They're well managed. They saw this thing coming. They spent three months training and getting up and ready. So you're totally right. It's very variable. And I think fully remote can work quite well for the types of tasks that are relatively repetitive in particular, easy to monitor and evaluate for people that want to do it. So Take Stanford, our, you know, our employer, they have about a thousand people working fully remote. Most, these are all volunteers. No one's forced into it. They all have pretty rigorous performance reviews. They're off, often doing a lot of things like IT support, payroll, call centers, where there's a large flow of relatively similar stuff. And so it's easy to manage and motivate them. The other extreme, you know, marketing, creative marketing, or maybe federal government employees, that's much harder. That's more creative, harder to monitor, harder to evaluate. That's a better fit for hybrid. Right. So let me say a few things in response. First, um, the way I think about the the point you made, if you do it with no planning, it doesn't work very well. Yeah. And of course, when the pandemic hit, it was a shock. So the, there was a lot of massive shift to work from home, including fully remote work without much preparation. And you know that that was part of the reason why a lot of those early experiments show negative effects. Um, so so I think there's an there's a broader lesson there, which is if you're going to make remote work, whether it's fully remote or even hybrid, work effectively in your organization, it does take careful planning. It takes complementary investments in IT support um, and uh, performance evaluation. It, pro it may take a very different set of skills among managers. So it's not an easy transition, even when work from home in settings where it will work well, it's not an easy transition. That the second thing, another thing I, you mentioned is, well, the workers loved it, even, even when it didn't appear to be productivity enhancing. And, and here I wanna introduce a key conce conceptual distinction uh, that often uh, is running around in these discussions of what workers think versus managers think, but is, but, but is a source of confusion because it's not stated explicitly. So when you go to managers and you ask them about productivity, they're they're naturally thinking about uh, you know how much work gets done by my staff per unit of paid time you know if it's an hourly worker you know how much per hour or if it's so if somebody gets paid weekly or monthly then it's how much work do they do per week or per month that's a perfectly natural way to think about productivity in fact it's 
what the statistical agencies typically try to measure, some notion of output per hour. But if you think about it from the worker's perspective, they're saying, how much do I accomplish for the time I have to devote to my job? And that time includes commuting time and also making yourself presentable in the morning uh, before you uh, rush off uh, to work. So you can have a big time savings on the worker side that from their perspective means I'm more productive. I get more done for the same amount of time devoted to my job, but from the, from the manager side, doesn't look like much. So just to put some numbers around this, suppose you work an eight hour day and you've got a 30 minute commute each way and you're equally productive as conventionally measured, whether you're at the office or at home. Well, then the worker says, wow, I get the same amount of work done and I spend an hour less per day. That's that's more than a 10% productivity boost. So I think that that distinction actually is running around many of the contrasting narratives you hear coming from workers and managers. And the the, the other thing to note on this on this score is that from society's perspective, it's that less conventional approach to productivity that's probably a more appropriate one. Because from society's perspective as a whole, what we care about is how much market output gets produced for the time it takes to produce that output. And commuting is part of that time. And so even a lot back to these um, negative, uh, negative effects of fully remote work that uh, several studies find, that's using the conventional measure of productivity that doesn't factor in uh, the time savings uh, associated with commuting. Totally agree. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this is one of the most positive things to happen to U.S. society in a, in a while. If I go through it, it's profitable for firms. It's why firms are mass adopting hybrid. I'm not trying to push fully remote. Mostly people are not fully remote, but hybrid is make saves firms money by reducing retention and recruitment costs. It's great for employees. We know from our work, so Stephen and Jose, for example, would be collecting data showing employees value that at about the same as an 8% pay increase. And it's good for society. It appears to reduce pollution because there's a big reduction in commuting. And there's some amazing studies looking at time use, showing that all this time that people save from commuting, about 10% of it's spent on time with their kids. So you can yep. imagine in the long run, we have this huge educational shock from the pandemic. Some of it is thankfully being undone because parents have more time to spend with children. Yeah, exactly. Let, let me elaborate on this a bit. I, I'm, I'm fully on board with the idea that on balance, the shift to work from home is really a huge social benefit for the reasons you described. Um, doesn't mean there aren't losers in the process. And part of, part of, I guess what I would add to your remark is part of the change that's happened that I see as a good thing is before the pandemic, for 95% of the population, if they wanted what they regarded as a good job, they were kind of stuck going to their employer's work site if they were full-time five days a week, okay? You didn't have much choice in that regard. Now there's this explosion in, in the variety of working arrangements on offer concentrated among better educated people. It's, not, it's, it's less true for people who work with their hands or do face-to-face -face work with customers and, or have to work in a factory. But among the college edu educated class, for many people, they can now choose among jobs that are traditional in the office five days a week, fully remote or hybrid. Hybrid's the biggest ex expansion. That, that expansion in choice is just tremendously beneficial because it allows people, if they want to, to save on commute, to spend more time with their kids. But if they don't want to, they don't have to. If you are the kind of person who thrives on working in the office five days a week, you can go work for Elon Musk or some other company that um, really wants to do business that way. So there's this explosion in the variety of working arrangements that I think is tremendously beneficial. And you and I have discussed, we, we're, we, we kind of like to do research on this, but I don't really have a lot to report yet. But I'm of the view, and you can tell me if you diff disagree, that the whole shift to work from home has expanded the opportunities to participate effectively in the labor market by groups that were somewhat disenfranchised or on the market uh, on the margins before people who live in remote out of the way places people who might live in urban you know poor urban areas where there aren't many good jobs nearby people with young kids who who really want to be at home with their kids maybe they still want to work but they want to be at home 
around their kids. There's And people have physical mobility impairments. For some people, the commute is just a, a huge physical challenge. So that's another reason why I think this, this shift is actually got positive social consequences. No, ma ma I mean, massive effects. One of the exciting things to think about the long run effect is the impact on growth. So as we know, inflation is high. Why is inflation high? Because the economy can't produce enough goods and services. We need more people. Labor markets are tight. Turns out, if you look in the data, work from home may generate a big increase in Americans that can work. So two groups, we have some kind of preliminary figures on. One is Americans with a disability. So if you look at labor force participation rates for those without a disability, which is something like you know, 80, 85% of the workforce, that's flat pre versus post pandemic. If you look at participation rates for Americans with a disability, which to be clear is quite a broad term, so that it would include people that you know can't walk long distances or have difficulty carrying you know large weights or, or serious back pain, that's gone up by about 5%. And that's equivalent to about 2 million extra Americans that are now in the labor force. So I have a friend of mine and she works from home now four days a week. And she says, look, I have real bad back problems. Makes commuting unpleasant. Also makes sitting in a desk chair really horrible. When I'm at yeah. home, I can lie on the bed and she sets something up where the laptop's like affixed to this frame and she can work lying on her back. And that's you know a complete game changer for her. So there's 2 million more Americans, it looks like, are working now with disabilities. And then another group, We've seen some improvement on in labor force participation. There's also female employees. So that's gone up by about 1% versus pre-pandemic. And it looks like that's maybe an extra million employees. A lot of folks that would have heavy childcare duties and can now go into work. People, you know, I think about my parents when they were close to retirement. They kind of didn't want to go into the office five days a week, but they'd maybe go in three or two. Or so. so I think it's hugely positive. I think we're going to see many millions, as you said, many millions more Americans working. They may not be entirely full time, but they're definitely working. I think it's really positive and it actually benefits all of us because it helps combat inflation. Yep. Yep. We're going to come back to this topic on this podcast uh, with, with the future guests. So I agree with you. It's really important. So Nick, last question. Um, what are the big open questions about the connection between work from home and productivity? Um. I tell you, I'll tell you three questions that come up a lot. They're kind of practical slash research. Um, so one of them is how many days a week? So we kind of like, you know, everyone's gone to hybrid. But even last night, someone said, look, in, you know, how many days? And I'm like, to be honest, Raj Chowdhury has a bit of research in this at Harvard Business School, but it's pretty, you know, there's not much. That isn't a huge sample. We honestly don't know. Um, should you come in three, four days? You know, I'm involved, I'm an advisor to a few startups. You know, I'm like, some of these have invested in it. In a sense, you know, they're my companies have a personal interest. Even for them, I'm like, I don't know. So how many days? I think, as you said earlier, it's going to depend. So if you're a coder, mostly working on your own and occasionally catching up with team members, it may be one day a week or one day or retreats every, you know, three weeks will work. On the other hand, if you're designing some maybe complicated marketing campaign that you need to work with six other people, you may need to be in four days a week. So one is how many days. Um, a second is how to save on space costs. So it's been an enormous frustration amongst employees and CEOs about uh, we haven't managed to reduce space. So I, I've heard this so many times from heads of real estate saying the CEO is like beating me up. Because, you know, the CEO is saying footfall is down in the office by 50 percent, but space is only down 10 percent. I'm failing. I'm missing, you know, that other 40 percent. And the problem is everyone's coming in on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So research or a practical question is, can we somehow reschedule things? So, Steve, you and I teach and universities know this with teaching rooms. You know, we don't all give class at the same time. We have a schedule. So the rooms are pretty full, but we're teaching at different times. So will will that be the future of firms or will different teams? And then. um the third question that comes up a lot is on coordination. So there's this big battle on hybrid, coming back to how you motivate it. Should you let each person choose? You know, we like choice. Americans like, you know, everyone likes choice. Should I get to choose if I say, when I come in Monday, Friday, because my spouse comes in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or should we coordinate? And should each team or company coordinate? And the benefits of coordination is the reason Americans want to come in or anyone wants to come into the office mainly is to work face to face with coworkers. So I actually see coordination slowly winning out, but it's a tough thing. You know, managers are struggling to persuade their employees. And, you know, it's 
they, I think in econ terms, the spillover is positive spillover. So if you and I work together, if you come in, it benefits me too. And that's really why coordination seems to be changed. But again, the research on this, this is all anecdote and practical evidence much more than research. Yeah, you reminded me that even though uh, work from home is here to stay, exactly the form it will take is still very much a work in progress. Uh, and comp companies are grappling with exactly this issue for reasons of coordination and what it means for productivity, but also for the cost savings reason you talked about earlier. So Nick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up here and uh, one, one more advertisement, this time uh, for a three-day conference on remote work that you and I with others um, co-organized that was held, uh, I think, last month at Stanford, sponsored by the Hoover Institution uh, at Stanford and the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. Uh, there are a lot of fabulous papers presented at that conference, and some of some of the uh, some of the presenters will be featured on future episodes of this podcast. I'm uh, lining that up now. Um, if you're interested, our audience members can find links to the papers, the slides, and uh, videotapes of the presentation uh, at my website. That's stephenjdavis.com. Stephenjdavis.com is the website. Nick, I want to thank you for a truly fabulous conversation. Uh, and uh, also just thank you for being a collaborator with me in this in this really exciting area of research. You know, there's just there's a lot going on and everybody's interested in it. So thanks so much. Fantastic, Steve. It's great to do this. And I should say we are hybrid. Like you're in the office, I'm at home and we're actually doing <laughs> this right, over, right. over Zoom. So I don't know if people can imagine this, but, you know, five years ago, you'd always do podcasts in a, in a recording studio. But now this is the brave new world. Exactly. All right. Um, well, for more podcasts uh, on the economic and societal implications of remote work, uh, stay tuned to this channel. Bye for now. <laughs>